this this soil here is is really uh, I, I I I don't know I might even call it unique from the standpoint of its relation to ability to grow blueberries. Uh, we start off with we start off with 10 to 14 percent native organic matter, and uh, it's a silt loam. Uh, about we're we're soil here about six feet deep. Uh, it changes from this brown to a little uh, from a dark brown to a little lighter color uh, at about 30 inches. But the organic matter in it is an important aspect for for blueberries. In fact, when you when you go to plant blueberries on a place that's not so suited as this, the thing they do is add a gob of organic matter in order to get some air into the ground. The roots are not a very efficient root. Uh, these old plants are probably 80% of the root is up in a zone like this deep and, and, and about that wide. So it uh, affects your irrigation as well and affects the ability of the plant to get some oxygen into the roots. Really, really unique soil. Well, and not only from this, for this crop, but for any other crop that you're wanting to to grow on some intensive basis. When we, uh, I can show you the seedlings after a bit, but um, maybe I probably shouldn't, they're full of weeds. Um, but one of the things about this ground is that um, in the wintertime, our harvest season for the tree seedlings is December, January, February. Um, after an inch of rain, give me 24 hours and I'd be back on the ground and, and lifting seedlings. Uh, you know, soil that's heavy in clay, you just have, don't have that kind of an opportunity. It's a it's pretty unbeatable ground, and should <laughs> should never should never be doing anything other than agriculture. And I have to admit, I my uh, an important objective in my life was to was to stop the development of mossy rock up there and leave the rest of this silt loam for for agriculture and um, didn't work. It's, it's some of this is going into housing and whatever own development. It's uh, it's an unfortunate use of of this valuable ground actually. But economics has has its way of controlling things. This one, as you can see, is quite a little taller than what we've seen before. And I don't worry too much about the height on this because we machine pick this variety. I've only had hand pickers in here a time or two. When these clusters get to be hanging here, a great big full of berries, I thought, oh man, we done it in about 20 minutes. They say, um, maybe not. <laughs> I've only had them in here a couple of times for little short periods like that. Um, but this this one, as I was just explaining earlier about the pruning, is you might notice that this middle is pretty well cleaned out in here. We've got a little bit of stuff left up in the top here that's going to drop down in the middle. But um, for the most part, we turn it to, to expand, uh, open out. Uh, height isn't too much of a problem to me. I usually have about this much of the height on some of those limbs. Bend over as I go over with the machine. I raise the machine up as high as it'll go, and uh, still, yeah, you wouldn't. You'd need a step ladder. You're going to pick these yourself at home. <laughs> but this plant, these plants were planted in. 69, 1969, I think. Uh, it's kind of staged in here. This is a part of that pasture I was talking about that converted over to, to blueberries. Weeds in here, I'll point out something else about the weeds in here. This is a this is the result of a new weed killer to me. And uh, it's a, just a burn down product. I didn't get, we backpacked. That's how we got that. I was working on the nut sedge. But, um, and earlier in the season, I got some down underneath here. I'm gonna have to learn more about the use of it. You can see in the blue crop row behind there, um, how that worked as well. That uh, late germinating seeds, see it was a burn down product. Late germinating seeds are gonna, gonna happen after you've put your, your weed killer down. So you have to come back and, and burn it down with something else again. There's another old variety over here 
Um, we haven't, we uh, generally have not tilled for years in here. Um, we planted this field here in 1967, that one back there in 69, and we cultivated for a year or two or three while they were young. Um, and we can carry the irrigation overhead over the top of the plants. But um, pretty soon we started avoiding that, just not doing it, not cultivating anymore. One of the things that kind of taught me a lesson was that I, boy, I had a rototiller. Man, I'd get right up next to the plants. Well, I realized after I'd done it that I'd cut off a bunch of roots from my blueberry plants because I, yeah, you could get up close, but you can also rototill too deep because those roots spread out so wide. So it's kind of that was kind of the beginning. I, I've I've had more problems with weeds than probably anything else in here over the years. The blueberries don't don't compete well with weeds, but so I have stuck with weed killers to to try to control that vegetation rather than than cultivating, which I think is that's probably good for the good for the world <laughs> to avoid to just turning up that ground. Every time you stir the ground up, you get on the batch of weeds. So. <laughs> Might as well skip that in the first place, but it's in the fall. We'll get you up on a top of a truck around here so you can look across the country. Uh, pretty nice landscape material. And uh, you can do, you can enjoy that in the yard as well as by the acres in the field, as far as the fall colors are concerned. And, uh, and then the wintertime, again, you get a color in the wintertime. Pretty much mostly yellows in the winter, pretty much mostly reds in the fall season. So we get a couple of views of that uh, when it comes time. Right now, I'd like to show you a little bit about, about my process of propagating blueberry plants. These, these plants were stuck as a as a softwood cutting a year ago, uh, rooted by about the 1st of August, and were dug like in late December and put directly into the one gallons. I really can't claim anything original in this process. I learned, I learned this from a couple other places, particularly Dick Drew. But that, we'll take a look at the peak down this other house here in a second. That business of, of the rooting, of rooting softwood cuttings, um, that it took, a, it took a bunch of experience to figure out that this was probably gonna be what I wanted to do. Uh, you can propagate blueberries three or four different ways. You can grow some seed, and you get a little bitty seeding like this tall the first year. And of course, if you're gonna make a new variety, you start from seed. You can vegetatively propagate by graftage, well, that's done for very specific reasons. You can propagate blueberry cuttings, some hardwood cuttings, in which you take a whip like this out of your bush, and that whip, the fresh season last year's growth, that whip might become their main stem 10, 15 years from now, so you kind of think twice about using that. Or you can use a softwood cutting, which we take in June, and we're taking a little piece like this. Well, that little piece is next year's fruit <laughs> so you think about that one a little bit too um, with the hardwood cuttings oh there's another step and that is with uh, with tissue culture and with that you'll start with a little piece of mar apical marish stem about that big and you can produce more plants than you know what to do with with, with um, tissue culture but it has a really important role in the production of of blueberries, particularly from a standpoint of developing new variety, because you can get that little apical mare stem off of, off of a pretty small plant, and next year you've got a whole gobble plant of that same thing. So uh, that's uh, that's a pretty important step in uh, in coming up with a new variety. Well, my softwood cuttings is uh, uh, versus the hardwood. In both cases, you've got a stick in the ground that has no roots. And in the hardwood cuttings, you're counting on some restored energy in that stick. And in the meantime, you've got to provide some 
bottom heat and then once that little bud those little buds start to grow you need to provide some high humidity uh, in the in what I do with my softwood cuttings I don't have to deal with with the bottom heat so I make some saving out of that I uh, the um, there again uh, however I'm sticking a thing in the ground like this big with no roots and you hope that that thing is going to develop some roots here pretty soon in the meantime you've got to hold really high humidity I try for 80 90 percent humidity I don't quite achieve that but that's what I'd like to be doing so you can't avoid the missing that was one of the important steps that I had mostly got worked through that still isn't finished yet but but at any rate, I can make a plant here like this size that you can go to the field with now uh, with it, basically a year and a half's worth of, of growth of time involved in producing. Out of one gallon is to go to a three gallon short, which is only about that deep, but it's just kind of wide. So you, you're building a, you're offering it uh, something that's more like what it, how it wants to grow. Okay, let's so the fruit idea didn't work, so I just tried the plants thing, and that's that's working. I've got plants for sale now, and we're making making more. The, um, this ever-bearing variety puts on its first spasm of fruit, takes a race, a rest, and then comes on for the rest of the summer. And in this rest period, it starts throwing out gobs of runners. Well, I'm going through and I'm picking off those runners and and, re and, and potting up. We're going to have some more plants available next spring. Not too smart a marketer. I was selling them for first. I sold them for two dollars a piece, and I found out no, they were going for a lot more than that in Chalice. And so I finally I got to notice that Home Depot I had the same one gallon plants for eight, and so I raised my price to five. <laughs> Mine were better looking plants than theirs, anyhow. That was a that was a that's my strawberry story. Actually, it isn't quite all the strawberry story. Dad tried raising in this. He he tried a lot of different things in this Moss Rock silt loam, and. Um, Boy, oh man, we can make some nice strawberries. But this, uh, you may not have noticed when we were looking at that soil about how, how, how this little fine dust, every time you take a step in this fine dust, it go poof, 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 and that dust got in around the seeds. And we took some to sell down to National, and boy, they tried like the Dickens to get them cleaned up, and they couldn't they even, even soaked them in brine overnight to try to get the soil out of them, they couldn't do it. So that was the day before we had soil cover. Now I bet we could raise some pretty damn nice strawberries here with soil cover nowadays. But uh, that there was a long gap between that experience and, and mine there a year or two ago. So what do you think of them apples? Oh yeah. That's Albion, varieties Albion. Pretty nice berry. I think I'll eat it. Should I eat it with what drooling down yeah. a little bit? Yeah. 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 This uh, this will work. Uh, and for a home gardener, th this is certainly an idea that will work. And you don't need a whole lot of space to do this. As you can see, I'm only using a fourth of a house, a little over, half a house maybe. Boy, this house is awful dry right now. So, can't figure that too much. Too much complications. That um, moisture going into the air like that, and a little bit of a breeze through here, it'll just grab that uh, temperature and just carry it right out of the house. Um, but this is the this is the root of the cuttings being rooted. I didn't show you any roots. Um, but these were stuck in here in the latter part of June and they're just starting to get a little callus showing. I picked up one the other day and it had a little tiny root about that long. So we should be rooting by around the 1st of August. And when that, when that happens, why then we change from this mist system to an irrigation system and add fertilizer so that we've got a Hoping for a plant there about uh, almost four inches of growth or something by Christmas time. At that, and at that point, we let them go dormant so we can dig. 
and uh, try to work with the, try to work with the temperature and what we've got available. We work in here when the days are pretty dang cold outside, and I can add some heat if I need need to, so they can work in here. But we can get them out of here, and then I can carry them into the barn where we can warm it up even more and do our potting in there. So, how many blueberry plants do you sell a year? I don't know, four or five thousand, I guess. So where's not, not a very big operation. Anymore. Where's your main market? A uh, big share of my market is is in uh, in the local area, really. About Western Washington, I sell some to Eastern Washington. We make about one, two, basically three different sizes. I don't sell Rudy cuttings as such. That's that's another risky business. One gallon, or even to an even greater extent, into as bare root plants, which are fairly cheap way to get into blueberries. A um, little, a little more detail about how you have to take care of them as a bare root plant. But I sell quite a few in, in ball and burlap. And I don't know there's very few other people that deal with ball and burlap. The reason I even got to thinking about ball and burlap, I remember you mentioned about the nice fall color. I said, gee, these guys are a landscape material. So the landscape thing on rhododendrons, they're very close cousin of rhododendrons, is, you know, you put them in the yard, you got a root ball on them. So, okay, that's what I started making out of blueberries and make a root ball. And we sell quite a few that way. We, we don't. We've been selling direct off the farm here since the beginning of time. Making, our first crop was in 1949, I think. Dad and Mom planted his first acre and a third in 1944. Mom's teaching school. And uh, Dad said, boy, you know, that's an idea. We plant. They, 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 they'd had about a dozen plants in the garden the, the summer summer before, year before, and boy, that looked like they were growing and making some nice berries. And, okay, there's something that mom and the kids can do in the summertime. So we planted in 1944, and by 1950, we had we had 25 hand pickers and produced about 10 or 20 tons of berries. So that, well, now maybe this is something more than <laughs> the kids can do. And then in 52, we started planting that acreage across the road and so on, it all, it all grew from that.